Last few weeks, um, we, we've been exploring, exploring, discovering two major themes of the Bible, covenant and kingdom, and uh, we've seen how God uh, desires uh, for us to be one with Him, to have our identity in Him, and but He also um, wants us to know what that means, how that lives out in life, you know, what the, what the kingdom's all about. And so... Uh, Put those those two triangles up again. He introduced those last week, and um, the one there on the left is the the covenant triangle. God is our Father. We get our identity from Him. Um, he tells us who we are. We are His children. We're His son. We're His daughter. And then we just naturally obey out of that. Our life just kind of moves out of that into obedience. And then the one on the right is the the kingdom. Kind of helps us get an, an idea of this. But the our Father is also a king, and uh, He vests us with his authority and it's his authority but he vests us with that and of course then out of that authority then kingdom power comes so uh, you know it's just a couple diagrams kind of help us remember some of this but today we're going to look at primarily about how identity uh, comes to us uh, in the in the covenant piece and we're going to look at the temptations of Jesus and what we find is that the reason Jesus is able to represent the king, the, the reason that he says, my kingdom has come and he had such authority and such power is because he knew his identity. He knew who he was. And he never wavered from that. His identity is, is in question. If his identity is in question, excuse me, then, then he would begin to question whether he's God's son or not and he would have no authority. Remember how the scribe said, well, you teach as one that has authority. That was one of the things that they noticed. And that wasn't like, you know, he was a really eloquent speaker or anything. It just meant, means that he knows who he is. So let's look at Luke 4, 1 to 12 today. We'll put this up. Uh, Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It is written, People won't live only by bread. Next, next the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Now, Jesus answered, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. Now, there's a phrase here that's used by, by the tempter, um, used a few times. It's uh, going to be crucial kind of for our understanding here. Over and over, he uses the phrase, um, so you're the son of God, or if you're the son of God in some other translations. In other words, this is the challenge. So you think you're the son of God. Well, then if you are, then you would be doing these things. And what he's doing is he's going after Jesus's very identity. And he knows that if he gets that, it's all over. You see, if he can get Jesus to question who he is and what his mission is and who, who he is as the son of God, then everything else is done. Everything rests on this identity. I mean, and the same is true for us. If God gets us to question who we are, our identity, the battle's over. Now, in the temptations, the devil comes to Jesus after, after his, his, comes after his identity in three distinct ways. And these are kind of three ways that he often comes after us. So today we're going to look at uh, Jesus, how he comes after his appetite. He says, turn these stones into bread. And then he comes after his ambition. He says, I'll, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll but worship me. 
And then thirdly, he is his desire for affirmation. He says, jump from the temple. You know, everybody's going to like it. You're going to get affirmed. So those three things. And what I'd like to do here is just spend a little time on, on all, you know, each one of these and kind of explore, you know, what's going on and how this is rooted still in our lives. And um, you, you see f- for each of us, one of these is probably being, we're being tested on right now. And often it's really subtle, but kind of under the radar. But usually one of these is where we're living. So the first one, appetite. Obviously, the the tempter is going after the most obvious one here. Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days and has been fasting. So, you know, if you've ever not eaten all day, times 40. This guy is hungry, legitimately hungry. I mean, this isn't, you know, I kind of want something, but this is, I got to have food. Appetite's kind of a funny thing, you know. Appetite's kind of like the child that is kind of, always wanting our attention. Or you might relate to this, some of you, I always did, the dog that barks all the time, all right? That's the, that's the appetite. The dog's always trying to get your attention. The dog's always, always wanting you to do something. And, and um, there are things that our, our mind and our body crave, and, and we start to wonder, is God going to satisfy these things or not? You know, very slowly we, th- we start to think, I- I'm not sure that, that God can do this. I'm not sure that God wants to do this for this. I- I'm not sure that the Father really wants to make me happy. And maybe I need to do this for myself, you see, because I've got these appetites, I've got these desires, and uh, seems to be working for other people. They fulfill these appetites themselves, and they seem to be happy. They spend all their money on it. They talk about it all the time. So evidently, God perhaps can't do that for me, so this is what I need to do. And we start to doubt that God will give us the things that we need. So we take matters into our own hands. But it says that Jesus knew that God would provide for him, so he refuses the temptation. He's essentially saying, I trust God the Father to fulfill my appetite to feed me, and I do not need to perform some kind of trick, turning stones into bread to feed myself. So, I mean, for us, what what are some of the things that, uh, different appetites that that go after us? I mean, I can just name a few. Uh, Food, you know, it's huge, obviously, okay? Uh, Any of you were out restaurants last night, we're talking about this for worship. The restaurants were absolutely packed out the door. Every restaurant in town was maxed out with people with a legitimate appetite, but also wanting to be entertained. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Food, sex, the negative side of sex, porn, personal comfort, you know, TV, technology, starting to meddle. Most of us live at this level of satisfaction of our appetites that when it's threatened, we get kind of upset. Somebody starts messing with this food chain here to to, uh, how we're feeding ourselves, and people start getting upset. And in America, our desire and appetite for entertainment, here's one we can talk about. I mean, this is at an addictive level. People dial 911 now when their wireless goes out. It's an emergency. You know, I can't get on the internet. Dial 911 or my cable's down. Oh my gosh. You know, it's just a major trauma. And all for entertainment. These are things we, we crave that begin to shape our appetites in some really unhealthy ways sometimes. They begin to control us. You know, we lose our capacity to say no. We, we stop trusting that God can make us happy, that God can meet our needs. So what do we do? You know, if the tempter is going after your identity in this place, how do we respond? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, that only God can really fill us. We, we each are empty to some degree, but only God can really fill us. I mean, you eat a good meal, two hours, it's gone, right? No matter what you do trying to fulfill your body appetites, it only is temporary. You have to do it over and over and over. But, but God says, he says, I want to come to you and I want to make my home in you. I want, to, I want to take up residence in you. I want you to know, you know, that you're mine, that this appetite that you have. He says, I, I want to fill that with myself. 
And I know that that's kind of a spiritual thing talking about a physical thing, but it works. You know, when, when, when we know that we are gods, our appetites begin to diminish. They, they, their, their importance in our lives seems to go away. Uh, the early church fathers had another idea. They said, well, if you want to control an appetite that is kind of ruining your life, then they said, do something that you can do to get power over something that you don't have power over. It's it's a pretty simple concept. Dallas Willard said it this way. He said, do the things you can so you can do the things you can't. In other words, kind of go after this appetite indirectly. Um, Learn to use your will in an area where you have success, and using your will in that area where you have success will open up a door for God's power so you can then begin to attack the place where you don't have success. So it kind of goes like, well, I'm having trouble with a food diet, okay? But I love to exercise, right? You start the exercise, you can become disciplined in that. This is easy for me, but the food diet is much more, you know, chocolate is chocolate and ice cream, and, you know, it's just rough stuff. But strange how when you get the power in the exercise, that it starts leaking over and you start to find yourself having more power in the other thing. And that's what the ancient fathers would say. That's why, you know, we we announced uh, Lent's going to be here. It's the latest that it could ever be. March 5th is when we start. And um, the practice of the early church was to give something up for Lent. And obviously they could give one thing up that they had power over and see that thing then begin to have power in another area of their life. So, so do what you can in one area of appetite, and you'll find out that God has more power in the other areas. Well, let's talk about ambition for a little bit. Satan took him to a high place, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, uh, these are all mine. Uh, I got a fast track. You don't have to go to the cross. You can just bow down and worship me, and these are all yours, you know. A- ambition's usually a, a pretty good thing. I mean... As a matter of fact, it, it says in Scripture, uh, God, you know, if you're lazy, God doesn't like lazy. Um, uh, he uses a phrase in Proverbs oh, 10 or 12 times where he calls the lazy person a sluggard or a slug. Isn't that a nasty visualization of a slug, you know? That w- when you get lazy, you're like a slug. You step on a slug with your bare feet, you know, yak. You know, God says that's that's like who you are when you just won't do anything. But and you know, ambition ambition can be good, but when it gives us our identity, when we become the person that must win, all right, then it becomes a very dangerous thing. Uh, ambition takes away from us our our imputed identity, where God says you you are good. I I deem you to be my son or my daughter. Imputed identity. And we say, no, i got to work for it. i got to win something. We have to win at all costs, achieve you know, something, and we feel like we've done something. So now I know who I am because I'm a winner, you know. And um, we can't be God's representatives and can't be God's ambassadors if we're seeking to win or advance our own kingdom, and that's what that is. Sometimes, you know, God asks us to do some things that, uh, where we really don't succeed, that, that may happen to you in your life, where God asks you to fail at something. I think through Scripture of a few instances, I think of Job, old Job in the book of Job. God, uh, Job lost his, first lost his family, lost his health, lost all of his wealth. He, had, he was a very wealthy, happy man, and in just a matter of days, it's all gone. And Job has this saying, it's in, it's in the first chapter of Job, and he says, I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave this world naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, that's his attitude. Is that you can't really take anything away from me because I'm God's, and everything that I had did not define me. See, my ambition did not define me. Sometimes God asks us to lose. Or, or John the Baptist, think about him, Jesus' uh, forerunner, the man that appears, and, and here's John the Baptist, and he ends up, the end of his life, 
He, John the Baptist ends up beheaded because somebody at a dinner party didn't like him. And that he was the entertainment at the dinner party, his head on a platter. That's what he ended up. And yet John the Baptist said of Jesus, he said, I must decrease so he can increase. See, he's taken the place of the loser, John the Baptist. All right, I think of Paul, the ultimate loser, Paul. Um, Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians says, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Five times he was beaten, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At a day and a night I have spent in the deep. So he's a loser. The world looks at him and he goes, we don't want to imitate this guy. Man, he gets beat up all the time. But that's what God had asked them to do. So sometimes we're not, our ambition, and we're not successful, but we're significant. Sometimes God asks us to take the low road. But these men, they never wavered because they knew the Heavenly Father. You know, I think this one, this ambition thing, this is hard. This is hard for me. Uh, we're so conditioned to compare ourselves to other people. And it's easy like, you know, well, the, the cats lost, yeah, but Indiana lost too. So it's not that bad, right? You know, you, you, you get so, you, you think, my, my self-esteem, even when I lose, you, you look at other losers and you go, well, it's not that bad, you see. And, and really, what we need to do is we need to choose to lose sometimes. Um, if an argument isn't going the right way, here, here's an idea for you. Lose the argument. Just lose the argument. Well, what have you lost? Well, what if someone else wins the argument? Or what, what if your mate, what, what if your spouse won the argument? Just think you get to sleep with the winner, right? Instead of having to sleep with the loser. Then it kind of turns thing around, doesn't it? Right, just, just choose to lose in it. Years ago, we used to have a Sunday afternoons. As a matter of fact, we were talking about for worship a little bit. Sunday afternoons, we used to rent this, the school gym and play basketball. Um, there was less of me then, and I was uh, 20 years younger or so. And uh, the young men and the old men in the church all get together. There'd be you know, 15 of us, you know, 10 or 15 of us. And, and we called it playing basketball. Uh, we, had, we had a ball that we threw around. But anyway, remember, there was a, some of you might know Max Apple. I don't know if you remember Max Apple, some of you, but Max Apple was a, a guy that lived in, in Versailles, and Max was a really good athlete. I mean, he was, he was just a good athlete. He had played on teams and stuff, you know. He had, in college, he played. And uh, Max used to play with us, and Max, Max was so good, but he would choose to lose all the time. And, you know, you'd feel like, wow, I scored on him. I, I scored. He, I got right by him. Do you see my spin move? It's like in his mind, it's like in slow motion, you know. But, yeah, the, the old man got around me and banked a lucky shot in. And then you'd see him play against some other guys that were good. It's like, oh, he's really good. <laughs> you know, and he would do it without patronizing you or making you feel. He just, he just chose to lose. He was playing to play. You know, it's funny, and, and, and guys, we probably relate to this more, but in, in America, we, we play to win, right? No matter what it is, no matter what the game is, most of us, we're very competitive. Our ambition is pretty intact. We're not sluggards. We play to win, no matter what the game is. So what if we just played to lose? What if, we're, what if ambition is one of our problems, one of our temptations, and we just chose to lose here? And then the third one is affirmation. Uh, each one of these deal with kind of a different type of addiction. Uh, we, could, we can be addiction addicted to a, a certain appetite. That's pretty easy to see. Uh, ambition, addiction to success or winning. And there's also an addiction to affirmation, I think. Satan takes him up on top of the temple, and Satan says, Jump! Jump off! He says, It'll be fantastic! Right before you get to the ground, you see God's angels will catch you. And then everybody's going to go, wow, look at Jesus of Nazareth. Man, he jumped and he didn't get hurt. He defied gravity. Yay, he's our champion, Jesus, you know. That's what, that's what Satan tempts him with. Just jump off. You'll be okay. Everyone's going to see. 
And, J, you know, Jesus says, it's been said, don't tempt the Lord your God. Each one of these temptations, Satan comes to him with, the, with the, the word twisted just a little bit, and Jesus gives the word back to him correctly. Okay, that's how he actually fights him face to face. But uh, I think this one might be a little easier for us to understand. Uh, our identity, I'm going to say something here that sounds wrong, but I'll explain it. Our identity has to come from beyond us. Our identity does not come from within us. And I know we hear all this pop psychology stuff that we're supposed to go, you know, find out who I really am and get in tune with myself and discover my real identity and then, you know, be true to myself no matter what that is and nobody can tell me what's right or wrong if I'm true to myself. You know, you hear all this stuff, right? And, you know, you're supposed to go like, be very meditative and insightful and hear it all the time. Um, I did that one time, um, you know, spent some time and, you know, really got in touch with myself and discovered who I really was on the inside. And what I found inside was I am a frightened, spoiled little boy. And I decided I don't want to be him. Who wants to be a frightened, spoiled little boy? Don't you want to be somebody else, you know? And I, you see, the thing is, is this operating system that we're in, uh, to use a tech term, it, it's, it's got a worm, it's got a virus, we've got a Trojan horse in us. And left to our own, to our own identity, how we have come to be, we're going to find that you don't really want to be that person. God gives us an identity. Our identity comes to us from beyond ourselves, and he vests us with an identity. And he says, you're my daughter, and I'm well pleased with you. You're my son. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't care what you've done. You're still my son. You're still my daughter. You see, there's nothing you can do, is what he says. There's nothing you can do to stop you from being my daughter. There's nothing you can do to stop you from being my son. Because I declare it so. I declare it that way. Well, we try to seek the approval of others in so many different ways. I mean, celebrities. Think a celebrity can say one stupid thing and they're done. You know, Paula Dean. Paula Dean's done, right? Probably. Yeah, some things came out. She said a few stupid things. All of her fans, all of a sudden, you know. Remember the guy Kramer? What's his name? Um, yeah, thank you, Michael Richards. Michael Richards said a few stupid things he thought would be jokes in a comedy club. <laughs> Went from being a celebrity to a nobody, just like that. I mean, it can happen, but, uh, you know, if we're doing this affirmation thing, if we're, if we're getting our identity from other people, who do people think that I am? Do they think I'm smart? Do they think I'm pretty? Do they think I'm successful? Do they think that I'm intelligent? You know, do they think that I'm a good husband? Do they think I'm a good wife? Do they think I'm an athlete, athletic person? Do I dress well enough for them? Do people like me? Am I popular? The tempter uses the addictive process of affirmation to cripple us. So we have to remove ourselves from places and cycles where that addiction starts. We have to go to the source. We need to give up the affirmation. See, what Jesus is able to do is to remain unshaken in who he is. Um, he's walking into the temptations just prior to this. If you want to look at that, just prior to this at the end of Luke, Luke 3.23, he's baptized. You may not remember exactly what's happened, but John the Baptist baptizes him, and then a voice is heard, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. For Jesus does anything. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't performed any miracles. He hasn't been tested. God deems him to be his son and deems God's good pleasure in him from the very beginning. He said, I'm proud of him. I believe in him. And what God says of him, God says of us. If we're in Christ, if we've been hidden in him, then he says the same thing about us. So will you remain unshaken in who you are when your identity is attacked? If you get this identity in God the Father, you will. 
And then Jesus, after the, the baptism, he's led into the wilderness, that, that place, remember, that we learned a few weeks ago is that place of complete dependency on God. He's led there by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. For 40 days he fasts, and at the end of it, Satan tempts him with appetite, ambition, and affirmation. And then at the end of that, in Luke 4, 13 to 14, this is what's said. Luke 4, 13, 14 says, After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. Uh, other translations will say a more opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Now, look at what happened here. Luke 4, it says that Jesus is full of the Spirit. He's led into the wilderness, and he undergoes this this struggling and the suffering of the wilderness, and then he leaves in the power of the Spirit. And I want us to notice just a couple things about this whole process of what goes on here as the Holy Spirit leads him to be tempted. And the first one is, is that temptation is an opportunity. It really is. When, when our, your identity is threatened, there's enormous opportunity for God's kingdom to be advanced. In times of testing, your character is strengthened. You begin, because testing means, means improvement. It's proving who you are. It means you begin to live in a more unshakable reality as God's kid. And when that happens, you begin to truly believe whose you are and how you're made. The second thing is, is that the tempter comes back. This isn't it. He says, I'm coming back. I'm going to tempt you again. We see... Jesus being attacked in the very next passage. He goes to his hometown and he goes to church, synagogue on Saturday and he's preaching and he preaches his first sermon and they liked it so well, they try to kill him. It's a really bad sermon. A really bad sermon. He must have gone on belong longer than 30 minutes, don't you think? Because they take him out to the brow of the hill and they try to kill him out there. So, you know, you talk about being attacked again. Uh, if he's looking for affirmation from his family and the people he grew up with, he's not getting any because they don't like him. So even as you deal with your identity, even as things are settled and you build that foundation now, the tempter is going to return. There will be more and more temptations. As you get stronger and stronger, the temptations get more and more intense and more skilled. They're not as easy. They get more and more difficult. But every time that there is another temptation, there's another opportunity to press further into who we are and to stand further in our identity in God. This week, I want you to, to think about where you're being tempted. Is it appetite, ambition, affirmation? Uh, what way do you need to intentionally press into your identity as God's kid? And, and this week, guys, I, I want you to know this. I want, you, I, I want you to really, okay, lean in. I want you to get this. Your Father, your Heavenly Father, is with you, is near to you. He loves you exactly the way you are. There's nothing that you need to do to earn his love. It's, it's been given to you, you see. And that's your identity. We walk in that. <laughs> we're we're going to do everything to please God. That, that, that's that obedient side of the triangle. Can you live in that? Let's, let's just sit for a minute. I What you say that you're good, your love is great. Yeah. I'm broken inside, I give you my life.
As deep cries out 